wealth is accumulated as this asset takes a bigger and bigger bite out of all these different asset classes in the world. You know, gold is just the most low hanging fruit, the most obvious. It's going to eat trillions, probably tens of trillions, and maybe ultimately in excess of 100 trillion of value, I think, over the next decade or two. It's still early. It is still so, so early, gentlemen. This is the Blue Collar Bitcoin Podcast, a show where average Joe firefighters explore the most important monetary technology of the 21st century. We talk Bitcoin, we talk finance, and we talk shit. Greetings to each and every one of you and welcome back into the Blue Collar Bitcoin Podcast. Today, Josh and myself, Dan, are fortunate to share with you our recent conversation with Mr. Andy Edstrom. Andy is a chartered financial analyst and a certified financial planner, as well as author of the well-known book, Why Buy Bitcoin? Investing Today in the Money of Tomorrow. He's also managing director of advisor services at Swan Bitcoin. His opinions have appeared on many well-known media outlets, including The Wall Street Journal, Forbes, The Economist, Bitcoin Magazine, and Coindesk. Additionally, Earlier in his career, he spent time working in the belly of the finance beast on Wall Street at Goldman Sachs. Needless to say, he has a lot to bring to the table. In this hour, the three of us cover topics including risks that still exist for Bitcoin, Andy's time as a wolf on Wall Street, why banks are potentially on the road to obsolescence, growth of the Lightning Network, grappling with exponentials, why Bitcoin is fundamentally American, and the reason why Bitcoin is strikingly similar to a horny teenager. You can follow Andy on Twitter, at EdstromAndrew, and as always, you can follow us at Blue underscore Collar BTC. If you're enjoying this show and listening regularly, you can do us a legitimate favor by liking, subscribing, or leaving us a review. Last but certainly not least, BCB Podcast is sponsored by CoinKite, producers of the Cold Card, the Open Dime, the Block Clock, and a number of new products on the horizon, including the Sats Card, the Tap Signer, and a new Cold Card Mark IV. If you're looking to store your hard-earned capital on a dictator-resistant, authoritarian-proof, clown-repellent calculator, well, folks, I can tell you, your search is over. The cold card is simply the best option available and affordable in the world today. Don't delay. If you have Bitcoin on exchanges or your setup isn't quite right, fix it. ASAP. We both use these hardware wallets and we have for a long time. You can bank on the fact that we will never rep products or services on this show we do not believe in. You can access all CoinKite products at CoinKite.com, and be sure to use promo code BCB for 5% off purchases of cold cards. Okay, folks, sit back, relax, and prepare to have your mind stretched by Andy Edstrom. All views and language expressed by the hosts and guests in this podcast are solely their personal opinions and do not reflect their employers or organizations they are associated with. Do not treat any of the content in this podcast as investment advice or as an inducement to follow a particular strategy. This podcast is for entertainment purposes only. Andy, welcome to the show. Dan and Josh, it's a pleasure. Um, Really excited to uh, to have this chat with you guys. Love what you're doing with uh, Blue Collar Bitcoin. Thank you. We've both read your book in the last week, and I feel like I've been talking to you all week. I can't wait to dig into this. You're in our head. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to grease your wheels too heavily too early here, Andy, but my takeaway from finishing your book, Why Buy Bitcoin, is I'm not sure why it's not on everyone's short list. I don't want to be uh, hyperbolic here, but I think it's moved maybe to the top of my like intro intro resource doesn't do it justice it it's a comprehensive introduction that does bitcoin justice that's how i would describe it like a lot of other resources that you'd suggest someone pick up and read you're like well it misses this part or it misses this part i really felt like you did a great job of keeping it concise while at the same time all encompassing right love the read you hit every one of the major topics that matters for anyone that wants to start rocking this in any way so I couldn't agree more. Well, you guys are very kind. I really appreciate it. And um, it was my goal. What you described was actually one of the key goals, which was a comprehensive introduction and, um, you know, that that would be readable, basically, hopefully for a broad audience. And um, 
I really, uh, I really appreciate, uh, really appreciate those kind words. Let's dig into your journey a little bit. So give us and our audience a feel for when you first encountered Bitcoin and then when did it sort of go from interesting to important in your mind? So I'm one of those three exposure guys. Um, 2013 was actually on vacation with my wife and my very young son. And I heard it, an article on The Economist. I had my podcast for The Economist. And it totally went over my head. It was, uh, I guess, in the you know the run up in the bubble of 2013, and um, I, I didn't get it at all. And then second exposure was article in the Wall Street Journal about Ethereum of all things, and it was the Dow hard fork, uh, the Dow exploit. Let's call it. I don't call it a hack. <laughs> it was an exploit. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, and I didn't understand it then either. Uh, so yeah, it was third exposure in 2017. And a very smart friend of mine, Arun Rao, um, put it on my radar. And so that's when I started falling down the rabbit hole. And I love your question about when did it become important or when did I realize that it was important? And, you know, I came for the, for the number go up. I came for the money. Uh, I saw it as an investment or even just a trade at first. And of course, as I did my research, about the whole world of, uh, of altcoins, um, I started to build conviction around Bitcoin. And one of the reasons I wrote the book was actually to test the thesis. It was sort of, uh, it was, uh, it was, uh, it was what Bitcoin at 3K, right? After having hit 20K that I put pen to paper. Uh, this, was, uh, this was a test of conviction. For sure. And I think it's, I think it's probably around that time that I realized that Bitcoin was truly important because I needed to do the deep work and try and articulate it for myself on paper to really get the entire thesis down. And I think that's probably the process whereby I concluded, oh my God, this thing is really, truly fundamentally important and could shape the world that my kids are going to grow up in. Yeah. There's a so just jamming on this, there's a quote I had written down on this exact topic from your book. And the quote is, a single exposure, however, is not enough to infect someone with the Bitcoin disease. Only education and research of the kind that requires repeated exposures to the subject matter, including through reading books like this one, can do that. Most people on this planet have not been truly exposed. And I thought that nailed exactly what you're trying to capture there, which is it takes repeated exposure. I heard about it at least three times before it started to really dawn on me. I know Dan was the same way. I think everybody really, it, ne it necessitates like first, second blush. And then once you decide this is worthy of my time to go down the rabbit hole and truly understand and take some real research into this, that you can start to understand what it means. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, there's only one modest exception to that rule, which is the, I don't know, fraction of 1% of Michael Saylor. computer scientists, <laughs> Michael Saylor. Well, no, because remember, yeah. Michael Saylor was a multi-exposure yeah, guy. Yeah, he didn't get it in the beginning. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. Uh, his friend Eric. Oh, that's right. Uh, he had that tweet from 13. I remember that. His, yeah. fr his friend Eric, yeah, he had the 2013 tweet, and his friend Eric, I think, exposed him to it a couple times. And uh, yeah, so so even, even he didn't get it uh, the first time. But I have spoken with a couple of people who read the white paper and said, yeah, this is the thing, obviously. <laughs> and I'm like, what? <laughs> really? <laughs> How is that possible? How is that possible? But yes, for the for the rest for the rest of us mere mortals, the ninety nine point nine 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 percent of the rest of us, uh, it definitely takes more than one exposure to sink in. What characteristic of Bitcoin just grabbed you and wouldn't let go? Like, what about this protocol or network really blew your mind in the beginning? Yeah, I think that the ability to hold the asset and not have your transaction censored really did, uh, really did amaze me. I mean, the notion that, and this is one of those realizations that only comes with actually transacting on the network, right? This is one of the classic um, mistakes that investors make about technologies is they study them in the abstract without actually using them. I see this, I see this mistake being made by a lot of folks today still with Bitcoin. Yeah, it's like uh, you got to get some exposure and you got to use it and you got to just try it. So so I did have the aha moment when I actually, 
you know, signed a transaction and moved money on the blockchain. And the cocaine actually showed up. Yeah, exactly. And there was there was uh, there was some nerves there uh, for sure, uh, because you know I had just figured out what a block explorer was, and you know j- basically I was uh, first the money was there and then it was gone, but it hadn't quite arrived yet. And uh, yeah, th- so there was definitely some trepidation and some and some sweating. Uh, everybody goes through that experience, of course, for sure. But um, that was yeah, that was that was the magic moment I think uh, for me personally. Did you guys see that somebody, I don't remember the exact dollar amount. It was over a billion dollars worth of Bitcoin was moved to a new address with no test transaction the other day, like just in the last day or two. Baller move. Like there's somebody out there. Yeah. Bold move, Cotton. But I mean, I'm at the point where I can send a, con- a considerable amount without trying to test transaction. It's, it's just something that comes with having used this thing for years and the comfort level you have with it. But yeah, a billion. Ooh. I remember in the beginning being scared to move like a few hundred bucks. And now I'm not saying the heart rate wouldn't go up a little bit, but I, I think I can comfortably say I, I would, I would, I could move my entire stack in one file swoop and not lose sleep over it. But as Josh said, it's taken years of moving Bitcoin around to, to get to that point. I often tell people when they get started, Odell really planted the seed. He's like, don't use the test network, just use small amounts of Bitcoin and just move it all the time. Like literally move it back and forth incessantly. You know, get a couple hardware wallets, start a hot wallet, whatever, put five bucks on something when the fees are low and just move Bitcoin and watch it show up time and time again. And you learn to trust the network and the protocol. It's really great advice. And there's there's a, you know, there's a paradox here too, which is the more you've got at risk, obviously, you know, the deeper and harder to access you want your cold, cold storage to be which by extension usually means the less frequently you're using it, right? And so that's the that's a challenge, which is, yeah, getting up the curve and getting comfortable and confident with moving small amounts of money moves you to big amounts of money. But then you have the complexity behind, okay, if you put serious dough into this thing, you know, what's your, uh, what's your bulletproof setup and how often are you actually accessing that and so that's uh that's sort of the uh you know the schrodinger's bitcoin the is the money there isn't it there i don't know if that's ever solvable or escapable mm. but i guess it argues for having multiple stashes right multiple pieces multiple layers um such that uh yeah you've got different levels of risk at different layers and different levels of accessibility and comfort level can you tell us a little bit about your time on wall street i think people have these two kind of conflicting sides to how they view Wall Street. There's the, like everyone's in a cubicle, you know, working on bank software, kind of lame, like just a typical job. And then there's the other side of people, you know, watching the Wolf of Wall Street, thinking that they're all buried their heads in cocaine and, you know, at strip clubs every night. Like, can you tell us what it's actually like to work at Goldman Sachs? Like, what's the, what's the real deal there? First of all, I'm going to date myself here, right? So this was 2004 to 2006. So already we're talking about more than 15 years ago. And things change on Wall Street. This was before the financial crisis. So take it with a grain of salt, right? I will say this. Um, <laughs> one, of the, one, of, one of the guys that I enjoyed uh, working with, um, we would have donut day every, every Friday, like whatever. One of the interns would bring in donuts for, uh, you know, for everybody on the floor. And, uh, and this guy, he, uh, he grabbed a powdered donut and he dusted some on his finger and he, and then he dusted a little bit under his nose and he goes, and he would, he would go, what am I? 80s banker, right? 1980s (laughs) banker. (laughs) And the joke was mostly true, which is to say a lot of the excess by the time I was there had kind of already gone. And part of that was because it used to be that all these firms were private partnerships, right? And then they all went public. And so the level of scrutiny, you know, that that came into the space was significantly higher already by the time I had gotten there. So yeah, it wasn't uh, quite as much fun uh, as is portrayed in uh, in the movies. Let's let's just say uh, it was mostly it was mostly the former of what you described, which is like you know, head down, cranking away, uh, getting stuff done. That doesn't mean that there wasn't some you know some occasional. Uh, interesting situations going on. But the other thing too was I was on the investment banking side and 
there was more shenanigans, let's say, on the trading side. Um, there were still stories coming out about, uh, especially in the CDS market, because this was interesting, right? So the CDS, the credit default swap market. The guys who blew everything up. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> what, exactly right. Exactly what you said. What you said, Josh, they, one of the major culprits for, for bringing down the system or almost bringing it down the system in the financial crisis. And so the CDS guys were making tons of money. And so as far as like the, you know, the wild stories of, uh, of the cocaine and the hookers, let's just say that stuff was, I think, still going on at that time on the CDS desk and, uh, with the, you know, the guys that were selling that product and buying it, let's just say. You missed the good old days, it sounds like. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They sucked all the fun out of the room. You hear stories from, obviously not at our agency, but you hear stories from other places about the old days of like stuff that was going on at the firehouse, and it just makes your head explode in the year 2022. It's different times. We missed the good pickings, Josh. Yeah, we did. Wrong generation right here. Wrong generation. All the fun, all the fun was, had, uh, was had in the early days of uh, fiat uh, not the later days. The boomers literally ruined everything for us. Yeah, they like did. They ruined the financial they fucked system. everything up. <laughs> they had all the fun and like burned everything to the ground before we got here. And left us with the bag, <laughs> yeah. which, is why, which is why we Bitcoin. That's exactly. Right. What's changed since you wrote the book? So you published this in 2019. I'm assuming you were writing it and you, based on what you just said, you started writing it in 18 probably. Correct me if I'm wrong, but what... Uh, it was January of 19, January of 19, started writing it and was mostly done with it within six months. And then it was out in nine months. Yep. What has changed at all uh, about your thesis, valuation expectations? What surprised you about the trajectory this asset's been on? That's a great question. And um, I was actually just sort of updating a presentation that I gave based on the book that I'm going to, I don't know when this episode's going to come out, but I'm going to be giving a talk at, uh, Bitcoin Day Sacramento this weekend. And it's in that vein, which is like, okay, what was the thesis then? What's changed now? And one of the key parts of the thesis was that there's too much debt in the system and the easiest way out will be inflation. Okay. This was pre COVID, of course. Yeah. <laughs> so now what's changed? Uh, there's a hell of a lot more debt in the system now than there was even a few years ago. And so that's number one. And number two, surprise, the inflation's actually arrived. Yeah. So, so that's one major change. And arguably, it's one major uh, you know, expansion of the thesis. It's like, okay, well, this was already kind of destined to happen. And now it's basically guaranteed and happening in front of our very eyes. So that's one thing. And then thing two is, yeah, you know, target price. I did put a, you know, some pricing... Uh, expectations in the book. Um, and let's just say my expectations have gone up. Uh, <laughs> or let's just say the timeline perhaps has been Condensed. somewhat accelerated yeah. because COVID did did all this work for us to, uh, to just bring this debt problem, let's say bring the resolution of the debt problem that much closer and that much sooner. And so if you'd asked me in 2019, uh, you know, how long is it going to take for this monetary system to reset? Somebody probably did. I don't remember the answer, but I probably would have said, well, it could take a decade or maybe even more. And now I think it's rather unlikely that it's going to take a decade and it could even happen in like five years. We'll see. That's we, when we spoke to Lawrence Lepard, he surprised us. And, you know, he was talking two to five years, which we were just... I mean, I think we all understand that the trajectory things are on, it's fragile and, you know, things are moving fast as, you know, seen in Canada, but two to five years is not a long time. Even a decade is not a long time in the scheme of things like that. It's kind of like the old saying that sometimes decades happen in weeks. Yeah, that's right. And Lawrence, I think is really smart. Um, I was actually on a, on a Twitter spaces with him, cafe Bitcoin. People should check that out. Um, you know, we tend to have, uh, we've now, we've now basically, uh, joined up with Bitcoin magazine, uh, and Swan and, uh, and we've been hosting, uh, conversations there and Lawrence is a really smart guy and he's been around and thinking about hard money and thinking about the monetary system for a long time. Uh, and so, yeah, that, that got my attention when, when he says, you know, it could be inside of five years, uh, my, my ears perk up. 
Yeah. And he's got the background as a tech investor. I mean, he invested through the dot-com boom, saw that. So he, he, he brings a lot of experience to this space that I'm inhaling as much as I can because you just, you can't substitute for, you know, years in that seat watching markets and, and he really has a lot of ingredients to be able to see the implications of what's happening right now. Yeah, I agree completely. And just to riff off that a little, um, he's one, exactly, he's one of these guys who's been around a long time, has multiple different kinds of experience in the investment world. Another guy I'd highlight is John Pfeffer. So Pfeffer wrote this seminal paper in 2007, and it focused on, yeah, what, what asset is actually going to accrue a monetary premium and would any of these other digital assets do that? And his answer at that time was, you know, it's pretty unlikely. And um, I heard him interviewed recently on the Invest Like the Best podcast, and he basically reiterated this thesis. And he is, so he's a career investor, and he made partner, he was a partner at KKR, right, which one one of the best known biggest private equity firms in the world. And so he had that part of his career, and then he pivoted to tech and just obviously grokked Bitcoin and started publishing on it. And his view of the world at the moment is as follows. So he's he's probably a billionaire, right? He runs his own money. It's his family office. And when asked about his quote unquote crypto portfolio, he's like, look, it's 85% Bitcoin. <laughs> like that's the obvious, <laughs> that's the obvious opportunity here. Clearly the best risk adjusted return opportunity. Right. And then I have 50, this is him quoting him. Then I have 15, one, five percent of my portfolio in very early stage, you know, crypto VC translation well i write checks into these funds that you cannot access right you average investor and uh because we can make money you know investing at zero cost and then flipping the bag to retail (laughs) so it's just a reminder that there are in this world of bitcoin a few uh really experienced guys who've invested across different cycle market cycles different asset classes and they have a lot of uh, wisdom to share. Almost exactly paralleling what you just said from uh, Mr. Pfeiffer there. Have you guys read this digital assets piece by Fidelity, uh, Bitcoin First? I read the yes, whole thing in its entirety last week and was just blown away. I mean, they're making the exact same points that he's making, which is on a risk adjusted basis, this is the only thing you should reasonably be investing in in this space. Like, forget about NFTs, forget about Ethereum. And they even delineate here talking about the difference between proof of work and proof of stake, which is incredible for you know people of this caliber. And this it, it reads to me like something that guys were writing in the space in Bitcoin in 2015 and 16. But like these are guys way off the grid, you know, people that nobody took serious back then. But this is mainstream fidelity, a multi-trillion-dollar asset manager today writing stuff like this. It's incredible. And then you know talking about the Lightning Network as if as if it's like what we all know it is, it's just, it's mind blowing to see these people regurgitating this stuff. Comparing the date and time you published that book to today, one of the most unbelievable things is the development on Lightning. I mean, when you published the book, Lightning was literally in beta and now, or, or close to it, or maybe shortly after release. And now it's, you know, it's working in El Salvador. You got massive brokerage firms like Fidelity touting it. I mean, it's clearly positioned itself to be a viable second layer. And it's, growing exponentially it's a it's a it's it is a major change you know since the book was published and i'm trying to remember how i framed lightning at the time i think i framed it as a potential scaling solution and it was sort of like in the realm of okay things layer twos that could be built on top like this one maybe has potential but it's early and you're right it's it's growing exponentially it's been proven out it's hard to beat uh, it's hard to beat nation state adoption uh, in terms of uh, <laughs> you know validation that something is real and is working um i mean yeah governments uh, sometimes adopt things that fail governments do stupid things uh now and then but uh, but that's definitely a, a good indication and yeah it's it's just one of the ways that bitcoin is reaching its potential i mean there's so many there's so many as an investment, right? It's a bundle of options on on upside, right? It's gonna it's taking share from gold. It's you know it's it's taking share from offshore assets. Um, it's gonna take a bite out of the real estate market. You know, it's it's gonna eventually, if it reaches its potential, become transactional currency based on Lightning or other layer two and three solutions. And um, 
I mean, it's just amazing to see. It's amazing to see Bitcoin grow and evolve and all the talent that is, uh, that is building on this thing. Um, it's what an exciting time to be alive. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Just to give that some color, the white paper for lightning came out in January 14th, 2016. So, I mean, this thing is just barely over five years old at this point or six years old. And it's incredible how quickly this thing, and it is, and it's network effects are moving up exponentially. And this is what you make a really great point, Josh, which is this is what people struggle with, or it's one of the things that people struggle with, with Bitcoin and not only with Bitcoin, but with other technologies, which is on the one hand, the time scales are very compressed because what you just pointed out, like, okay, the thing's whatever, six years old, even from idea inception, and now it's taking off. And yet it's actually really difficult to estimate when that inflection point is going to happen, right? When, mm. when is the exponential going to take off? At least I find it, I find it challenging because depending on when you come into Bitcoin, you think it's happening now, right? You think hyper-Bitcoinization is happening as, as we speak, especially be, because most people come in when? When the number's going up. Right. <laughs> so they think they're watching it in front of, in front of their very eyes. They think they're watching uh, Bitcoin take over the world. And of course, that hasn't happened yet. And rather, what's happened is these cycles of adoption and ebbs and flows, but with you know much higher plateaus every time. And so, yeah, it is breathtaking to see, and yet it's difficult to anticipate whether an event like that, you know, basically exponential growth for uh, for lightning or or another second layer is going to happen four years in, or six years in, or eight years in. But the important thing is that uh, is that it's happening. You're totally right, and I I often say Bitcoin makes you earn it, as you said. 90% of people are entering when the price is going parabolic. Like price is the great teacher here, okay? It was the great teacher for probably the three of us at some point, right? And it yep. continues to be that way for people moving forward. So first of all, don't look down your nose at people that are attracted to the price going up because that's how we all got involved. The implication though is that most people have to earn it in the sense that they're buying it on an upswing and whether it's short term, midterm, they're going to have to probably be in the red for a little while before the thing kicks the other way. You lose a lot of people. There's a lot of attrition through that cycle, but that's also what develops conviction and true hodlers, right? But you're, you're kind of telling your buddies that just got involved, let's say in 2021, this is the price of admission, my friend. Yeah, I, I couldn't have put it better myself, Dan. I mean, that's exactly how it goes. Chances are for the average person out there who buys Bitcoin, Chances are very good they're going to be staring at losses uh, potentially for a significant period of time because they get in, they get in when it's overheated, um, which is you know which argues for basically dollar cost averaging, right? Mm -hmm. Accumulating over time. Yes, get your skin in the game. Yes, get your initial position. I mean, don't don't wait to uh, to get your feet wet, but then as you learn and as you grow conviction. Uh, and as you come to appreciate the cyclicality of the price of this asset, or even not, not even the cyclicality, but just the yeah, inability to, to predict where it's going short term, you know, just get comfortable, stack sets, accumulate over time, build your position, build your nest egg. I mean, that is the way to go for 99% of people. Yeah, we couldn't agree more on that point. I know you're not in the belly of the beast anymore in Wall Street, but what's your perception of Wall Street's disposition towards this asset? Like we I often talk about these four eyes on this show, you know, idiotic in the beginning to now it's interesting and my projection is eventually it'll get to important and then imperative for them. What what is your perception of where Wall Street's at with Bitcoin right now? I love those four eyes. I'm going to try and remember that. Um my perception, this, this has been a humbling experience for me, which is that I used to think of Wall Street as kind of monolithic in this regard. And what I realized is, you know, it's just a, it, it's just a story of different firms and different groups of people having, you know, being at different points on the journey. So like, for example, you mentioned this report that came out of Fidelity. And of course, you know, Fidelity has been mining since like, I don't know, 2013 or something. I mean, they've been around this thing for a very long time. And some of the 
more prominent names in the space now, you know, cut their teeth basically at Fidelity. They were at Fidelity Digital Assets or its predecessor, and then they, you know, went out and started businesses. So, so Fidelity, you could argue, is sort of legacy finance, you know, quote unquote Wall Street, although it's not the wirehouse banks. So if you want to just talk about the wirehouse banks, um, yeah, I think it's a I think it's a mixed bag. I think that you know, I, I saw this announcement out of BlackRock that I was kind of ridiculing. You know, they were talking about, oh, they're gonna they're gonna start allowing people to trade crypto using their trading platform, their software, um, which is called I think it's called Ladin, and they sell it. You know, it's the it's the widest used piece of trading software in the world. And basically, what it comes down to is, oh, there's a thing I can trade, um, then I'm gonna trade it. Wait, ask a trader what he thinks about about Bitcoin or crypto or anything. And his first question is, well, can I trade it? Number one. And number two, therefore, can I make money on it? So, you know, if they can make money on it, they'll do it. And th- I think that's kind of the stage that we're at. It's kind of the stage of, well, if there's demand for it, you know, they're, they're basically responding. They have not been, uh, they have not anticipated, obviously, uh, to their own detriment. They have been basically responding to just events on the ground. And in one respect, it's like, okay, what do you expect from these guys? I mean, right. the name of the game on Wall Street is squeeze every possible dollar of revenue and profit out of, every, out of every market opportunity that comes your way. So if there is a market opportunity and you can act on it without you know, risking your reputation or blowing up the firm, you know, then you do it. But it is a balancing act. I mean, that was one of my experiences, which I wrote about in the book at Goldman was these senior guys, these partners, uh, their job was basically managing conflicts of interest, right? They spent half their time figuring out how do I you know, squeeze more juice out of multiple parties in any transaction without overstepping the line, right? Without breaking the law and getting caught or without risking, uh, you know, risking uh, retribution from the government or the regulators or, you know, or, or your own clients. Although, although a modest amount of screwing your clients is perfectly acceptable on, uh, <laughs> on wall street, right? As long as in the long run, you still make money and they don't notice. Yeah. Right. As long as the fee is low, as long as you make more money than your, uh, you know, sec charges you for it. So you're on the exactly. green at least. Exactly. Um, so, you know, it was interesting. Um, so when I was there, it was, I was just a you know a young analyst, so like I really didn't know what was going on. I mean, I, I climbed the curve and, and learned a few things, but no doubt there was a lot that happened behind closed doors that I was just not privy to. And it 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 wasn't clear to me what was going on at the time. You know, it 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 required the uh, the hard lessons of history, right? Because I had left uh, the firm before the financial crisis. You know, basically, as always, it's when the tide goes out, you see you swimming naked and you see what's really going on. You see where the cockroaches are, right? Mm-hmm. Anyway, um, I digress. But where are we today with Wall Street? Yeah, I think it's a mixed bag. Some firms are embracing it. Others are just kind of taking it slow. It's an interesting, um, it's kind of, I mean, if it's a blessing to, it's a blessing to the Bitcoin industry. Yes. Uh, be, in part because... The banks could have built these businesses themselves. I mean, one is that maybe they could have co-opted it, okay? So that's one thing. Or they could have lobbied to you know, try and kill it many years ago. We're way past that stage. That, that ship has sailed. But it is interesting to think about, oh, the banks are coming r- relatively late to basically building custody solutions, you know, trading solutions, um, as well as just you know, brands for accumulating Bitcoin uh, and fund products. And so... It's really interesting. It's it's given all these entrepreneurs who saw this trend much earlier the opportunity to build businesses, um, some of which get acquired by the banks, and we've seen some of those deals, and others of which are so successful that they'll either be buying the banks themselves or they'll just you know be be growing and uh, yeah and basically taking over the bank's business over time over the next decade. Uh, so it's going to be really fascinating to see how it plays out. I agree. It's an opportunity. Like it, when you understand the inner workings of today's financial world, it's so rare for retail and the everyday investor to be able to take a significant bite at asymmetric upside the way people are able to do with Bitcoin today. 
I mean, you, you can get in before the really big money comes stampeding behind you. And the more you understand about how things operate, you're well aware of this. That is just a, that is a rarity. It does not come around very often. Yeah, I really want to underscore your point, Dan, because it's where we are. I thought, actually, if you, if you rewind the clock and you asked me a couple years ago, like, where would we be with institutional adoption today? I would have thought we'd be farther. And again, one of these realizations I had after the fact was, you know, first of all, you've got different layers and classes of institutions. So you have, uh, you know, retail and you have, you had family offices, then hedge funds, you know, then pensions, as you're well aware. Go Houston. Go Houston. Exactly. And so, you know, there, there's this very, various categories, insurance companies, and they're all on their own time schedules, number one. And number two, they can they each contain multitudes, right? Like, yes, mass mutual is on the front end of adoption, you know, for insurance companies. But I'm sure that the majority of insurance companies are are still playing catch up and it's gonna take them months and years to get on on the train. And so people still think, you know, people think that we're well into this game, but the reality is it's still such early innings. I mean, it really is you you can still front run the institutions buying Bitcoin today. There's no doubt in my mind that we are so early and that this wave of institutional adoption that I do expect will come is going to play out over years. It just takes time. The reality is too, that's a lot. So many of these institutions are going to be dragged in kicking and screaming. I don't think mm -hmm. some of them are going to voluntarily join this network because I, don't, I just don't think they might have a choice in the next 10 years. They're just going to have to. He, here's what I'm seeing now, because I'll focus on you know, my, my you know, first decade of my career was, yeah, you know, Wall Street plus investing in the buy side. And then the second dec dec decade is in wealth management. And that's what I'm helping you do right now, right, is, is launch a wealth management product to put financial advisors into Bitcoin for their clients. So that's what we're doing with Swan. And what we're seeing is much of the demand from financial advisors is coming from the clients and the financial advisors are reacting to client demand. And the conversation that's being had, even though many, many won't admit it, is client is saying, look, I'm doing this Bitcoin thing and I can do it with you or I can do it away from you. <laughs> and I would love to do it with you because I would love, financial advisor, for you to consider my Bitcoin position as part of my overall investment portfolio. But you know, if you're not willing to do that, that's fine. I'll just move the assets away. And nothing gets the attention of a financial advisor quite like, uh, yeah, quite like the client saying, uh, I'm going to move assets away uh, from you, financial advisor, and therefore your fees are going to go down. So, you know, economics wins, <laughs> as with most businesses. And uh, that's part of what we're seeing right now in the financial advisor community with respect to Bitcoin. Uh, what, what seems to be a potential inflection point for me tell me if you agree, Andy, is that right now it appears that, you know, legacy finance, traditional finance institutions are in large part moving this direction just to cater to client demand, as you just hinted at. And what, where this really starts going parabolic is when they move into this asset to protect themselves and their entire business model, right? That could be true of banks, brokerage firms, but also like Take Visa and MasterCard, right? They right now they're just like, yeah, yeah, we'll we'll do some crypto stuff right now. But when they see that this could disintermediate their entire bi business model and change fundamentally the way payments occur in the 21st century, there's going to be this oh shit moment for a lot of these behemoths where it, yeah. it goes from, you know, just catering to clients to holy crap, we're going to need to move this direction or we could be in deep water. Yeah, I agree completely, and I think. It's going to be really fascinating to see how it plays out. Some will adapt better than others. Uh, the reality is, if Bitcoin reaches its potential, and I think it will over many years, then demand for credit should be lower. And <laughs> so the role of the banks, you know, knock wood, <laughs> society will be better off for this, will be reduced. So you know, what will a bank look like on a Bitcoin standard world 15 years from now? We're going to find out, I think. And I think it's going to be smaller, less influential, 
and uh, you know that's going to be uh, that's going to be a positive thing for the world, in my opinion. I don't know if the two of you had a chance to listen to Jack Mahler's talk to uh, Peter McCormick. I, I loved the episode he did, and I think out of everything he said, which all of it was stellar. I loved when he talked about disintermediating Visa and how they're going to have to work on Lightning eventually and all that. But the thing that really stuck out to me was when he said he was speaking to somebody who was undisclosed about why this is going to totally destroy his business. And the guy is, you know, he's the CEO of some financial institution is like, I understand. We all fully understand. The problem is, is that we know there's a shark in the water and we, it, it's like we need to, we don't want to jump off of a floating boat. Before we know that this other this other vessel is sound, so we're trying to play this game of like we don't want to jump too soon because that could kill us, and we don't want to be too late. So we have to kind of <laughs> I, we talk. I feel like we talk about tight ropes a lot on this show as well. They're <laughs> they're walking this tightrope between jumping off the financial system as it is and being able to somehow swing their way into this new financial system. And I doubt many of them are going to be successful at doing it flawlessly, but having heard him say that and it never really occurred to me having not I'm not the CEO of a giant company like Visa but it makes a lot of sense that they would be looking at it this way if you put yourself in their shoes they're going to have to jump at some point they will they will yep. and, will and and it'll be really interesting to see how this plays out and i suspect that the wisdom of Clayton Christensen is relevant here um you know he was one of the first to write popular books about disruptive innovation and i can't remember which title it was i guess it's innovators dilemma he talks in detail through case studies he examines all these case studies of companies that saw disruptive innovations coming in their direction and yet were unable just unable to adopt or adapt or basically take advantage of the opportunity and there's numerous reasons for this one is you know sclerosis right just slow moving bureaucracy Another is the need to protect protect those margins, right? You got those fat margins. If you adopt the new thing, your margins fall. Right. So, you know, that's that's poison to you if you're running a profitable business. You just you can't cannibalize yourself. But there's also more subtle factors involved there, you know, having to do with management structure, having to do with how uh, the margins and the profits in disruptive innovations evolve over time. Of course, it becomes profitable and new business models evolve in the future, but in the short term, it's, you know, it's all negative for the incumbents. So it may just be another one of those cycles where the disruption happens, the incumbents can see it so clearly in front of their faces, and yet they can't necessarily adapt uh, and come out the other side of it successfully. So we'll see how it goes. Yeah, you're right in what you said, though. We're going to find out. I mean, the word the word inevitable is heavy-handed, maybe not fair, but the power of this protocol cannot be underestimated. I mean, the incentives and architecture by, behind this thing seem so clear-cut in terms of the direction they're headed. And I don't know. I don't know what to say to people. Whether you like it or not, this thing is happening, and you better find your place in it because it's not going to it's not going to budge just because you cry about it and don't like it and and whatever it's it we're, you're going to have to orient yourself around this monster isn't it amazing to see that we're still that so many are still in the in the denial phase right they haven't reached the acceptance phase <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. It, it uh it it is it is breathtaking uh it is breathtaking to see i mean part of it is the old uh yeah, it's impossible to get a man to understand something when uh, when his livelihood depends on not understanding it, when his paycheck depends on not understanding <laughs> Love it. Love that quote. Up to, Upton Sinclair, I think. It is. Um, yeah. yeah, and uh, yeah, it is, it's just breathtaking uh, to watch. It's especially breathtaking to watch as it happens over years because, yes, it's happening very quickly, but again, this stuff takes time. Um, you know, the, Bitcoin's a teenager now, just barely, and uh, it's still got some number of years before it reaches adulthood before it's you know before it's truly uh, you know before it gets in the weight room it'll probably get in the weight room in the next uh you know in the in the next couple of years and really bulk up and uh <laughs> at that point watch out right yeah. it's going it, it's going to be swinging around and uh causing trouble it's already unkillable in my opinion but uh yeah just wait it's going to be interesting times it's a it's an ornery, horny teen that just wants to fuck everything in its path right now. Look <laughs> out, man. 
uh, hide your daughters from it. <laughs> <laughs> it does seem to me, though, um, and I'm sure this is something a lot of people have compared it to, but Netflix and Blockbuster is such an easy way for people to understand this. Like if you were around in the early to mid 2000s, you remember Netflix was you order a DVD and it shows up two or three days later and you pop it in. And like, I'm sure Blockbuster at the time is looking at this like, what a joke. Like you can just drive over to our store five minutes away and get your DVD right now and you're going to pay late fees and all that. But they, the internet just exploded them. They didn't see this, you know, bandwidth exploding exponentially alongside of what Netflix's true plan was. And by the time they recognized it, they were trying to sell candy and candy aisles because they were understanding that they were going down with the ship and they had to sell as much candy as they could. And that's literally their business plan was to sell candy. It was a kick ass candy aisle too. Yeah, dude. It was like two aisles of candy. Oh man. They had a lot of good sour (laughs) candy. Yeah, and we all know how that went. And this is, I mean, the parallels to to understanding that business case and how that disrupted Blockbuster and how this disrupts financial, the whole financial system is a palm, I think. Yeah, I agree completely. Um, you know, my, my I loved uh, the way Jeff Booth, uh, you know, articulated uh, the case study of, of what you described and with uh, with Blockbuster and with the uh, with the financial system as it exists today it's just so plain that the internet disrupts everything and this is just the internet disrupting money and it i guess the you know the i think about my clients and their hang-ups and like you know how is it when it's so obvious so plainly obvious by this point that people miss it i guess partly it's still the notion of like you know government won't let it happen Mm -hmm. um which uh, you know is still one of my favorite pieces of fud. I think it's actually the most uh, the most alpha in Bitcoin exists in the government fud. And I'll explain what I mean. It's among all the fud or fears about Bitcoin versus the actual risk. The biggest difference in in perception, in my view, it has to do with the uh, has to do with the government risk. I mean, so many people are still worried about it. And I think the actual risk to the asset and to the protocol itself are so minuscule as to be, you know, near zero. Basically, it's it's kind of a, a laughable risk. Yeah. What is the fud? What What do you think is the primary one that we should be concerned about? What is number? What's the gorilla in the room as far as what people should be worried about for Bitcoin's potential problems? I'll take that. You know, question of like what What are the actual challenges that bitcoin must still surmount okay um you know can quantum computing crack ecdsa or schnorr yeah probably eventually um so you know will it eventually again this is the long-term view right uh you know decades out will we have to come up with a solution will those smart cryptographers who have managed to stay ahead of the code breakers, you know, for the last century of yeah. cryptography, will they have to do it again? Yes, they will. Um, you know, is it guaranteed that that will happen? No, it's not guaranteed. However, there's so much value writing on the system now, not only on Bitcoin, but also the rest of crypto. You know, it's also a bounty on that, as well as it's a bounty on all internet commerce. Right, all this stuff goes away if if public key crypto fails. So. Um, so that that is something that actually has to be surmounted, and that is a fair that is a very fair thing to explore. I agree with everything you said. Encryption will probably it, it stay ahead of the curve and everything, but that is going to require a hard fork if and when we get to that, and that's significant. It definitely needs to be considered. That's right. And then uh, speaking of potential hard forks, uh, you know, there's there's the block reward, and there's transaction fees, and there's the question of you know, will there be enough transaction volume and transaction fees? to maintain security of the network after the uh you know the block subsidy uh you know the, the new coins minted with with every block uh go away or reduce over time and again my expectation is yes that there will be transaction fees and therefore we won't require some kind of change to the protocol um but you know we still have to uh get over that hurdle uh, and it still is ahead of us. It's still a potential filter, and it is worth considering uh, the possibility that, yeah, just the the issuance of new coins uh, falling every four years or so 
might not quite provide enough security to the network uh you know a decade from now we'll have to see i'm optimistic do us a favor and uh let's double back bust the uh, over regulation regulated into obscurity banned yeah. bitcoin sort of government fud for us yeah so the first thing obviously is that properly handled you can store your bitcoin in your brain if you choose and this is a total game changer. I mean, this changes the game for custody. You talk about the U.S. as a jurisdiction, and you talk about prohibition, right? Because really what you're talking about is prohibition or de facto prohibition. I guess you could say, okay, there's a scenario which is like tax it so tax it and regulate it so strenuously, I don't know, sort of like tobacco or something. Yeah, so you nobody know that wants that, it. But that would exactly. still be a midterm risk. Like you're going to get some other regulatory regime in place that's right. going to view it differently yeah. eventually. We're going to move to El Salvador. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. So, so right, you can flee the jurisdiction, that's one. But I don't even think it gets to that point because I honestly think that prohibition, first of all, like alcohol prohibition, um, you know, or drug prohibition, alcohol prohibition was a moment in time. It didn't last that long. Um, it required, you know, basically a Great Depression <laughs> to uh you know to to get that kind of uh government overreach to occur which could which could be applicable <laughs> <laughs> which could be applicable i mean i have to be th that's actually an interesting point you know winding back the clock a few years like where were we before and where are we now yeah we're we're closer to uh to strange things right i mean you you watch what's uh what's going on in, just in canada just right now say that. Look at government canada. overreach um and uh you know i'm glad although i'm glad to see the pushback right um, I'm definitely glad to see the the pushback against that kind of overreach. So, so that's a risk um, in theory, but as a practical matter, if inflation remains high, which I expect it will, or let's say above trend, like where it's you know above two percent, significantly above two percent over the next several years, like you think people are going to go to the mat to defend, you know, their right to drink or uh, smoke pot or what have you. You know, imagine what they're going to do when you're trying to inflate away the value of their hard earned savings yeah. and and they can custody it in their head. So you can't confiscate it. I mean, that's night and day versus the, the drug trade where, OK, you find the contraband, you can take it. A, you can prove, you know, that someone possesses it more or less. And B, you can confiscate it. Not so with Bitcoin. So as a practical matter, you know, it's just it's near impossible for a. Uh, for a state to actually enforce the ban. I think this is why we see that China hasn't banned possession, right? Because they know they can't do it. Right. <laughs> they know it's ridiculous. Look like uh, fools. Exactly. They look like, exactly, like fools uh, being unable to enforce uh, a rule that they put on the books. And then I look at the US and I say, well, you know, what's more American than Bitcoin? I mean, Bitcoin's freedom money. Bitcoin's about self-reliance. Bitcoin is about basic, basic American values that most of us hold dear. And then you layer on top of the fact that there's already, the place is already lousy with us uh, Bitcoiners running around. And we vote and we, some of us, uh, you know, support political campaigns now. Um, Erica Rhodes, uh, for example, is one that I've been supporting. And, um, you know, it's, uh, I think it's too late. There's already too many American Bitcoiners we're already too big a voting and uh, and funding block, thanks in part to the fact that this is you know roughly a trillion dollar asset, and uh, yeah, so so the ship has sailed. I think it's going to be near impossible basically to uh, to beat back the tide. And then to your point, uh, Josh, I think uh, that you made is like, well, if it really comes to that, uh, then you get arbitrage between jurisdictions. You get um, city states that that welcome it in that that say, hey, we're happy to take the ingenuity and the wealth of Bitcoiners, you know, wave them in. Uh, and uh, so, so you get that competition basically that keeps the, uh, the Western governments in check that try to uh, move strongly against it. The thing that I, I find really heartening is I've been down this hard money rabbit hole for more than 10 years now. I remember, I mean, reading Austrian economics books that people would just glaze over and never... No, people would be like, who the hell is Ludwig von Mises? And these are the names that like, now are, at least in the little Bitcoin Twitter space, are starting to become more prominent. These ideas 
are starting to become more mainstream. And especially now, like when Dan and I talk about this at work, like five years ago in 2017, people would be like, all right, cool. It's internet money for nerds. Like nobody cares. Yeah. But when they're watching their you know, price of their beef go up seven to 10, 15% a year, starting to realize that like, wait a second, what the fuck is going on here? There's housing that they can't afford anymore. And new guys can't buy houses. They can barely do it. So now people are listening. They're understanding some of the fundamental problems that are going on. And this, this exponential awakening that happens because of the problems at hand that are actually forcing them to pay attention, I think is going to be the impetus that really catalyst, the catalyst that is going to, that is going to make this happen. Because people have to pay attention now. Before it was a luxury to pay attention. Now you have to, if you want to make it. It's literally happening in front of our very eyes. Even uh, old Wall Street hands are starting to figure this out. Ray Dalio, I see an email in my inbox today from Ray Dalio, who runs the world's biggest hedge fund. Oh, I thought he just sent that to me. (laughs) 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 Yeah, exactly. And uh, yeah, and I, I just pulled a quote out of there. I tweeted this morning. The quote is, quote, People are just beginning to transition from measuring how rich they are by how much, quote, nominal, i.e. not inflation adjusted, Mm, money and wealth they have, to realizing that how rich they are should be measured in, quote, real, i.e. inflation adjusted, money and wealth. (laughs) And you said it much more clearly than he did. So uh, he should, uh, you need to be writing, uh, you need to be writing for Ray Dalio. Ray, you need to take a leaf out of uh, of Josh and Dan's book, uh, here. I'll make sure I, I reply back to him and make sure he, he's aware. Yeah, we'll give him some consideration. They need they he needs you on uh, on his writing staff. We'll we'll see if we can get him on once or twice for maybe a couple minute segment. I mean, he might bring something to the table. Absolutely, Ray Dalio. Ray Dalio, blue collar Bitcoin is uh, is ready for you. <laughs> for the less financially and economically minded, though, you now have a couple handles you can grab on to to bring them closer. The touch points I've been using. How does this money just appear in your checking account out of thin air? They don't, many people don't have a good answer. Like, where is it coming from? And then, and then I, we talked about this on the show a lot, but just the, the individuals we're interacting with who are like, what's the deal? Why are my brokerage accounts and retirement accounts through the roof when we're going through massive global economic shutdowns? Like, these are places you can start with someone to draw them in to the inner workings and the underpinnings of how the economic system works, what is money, all this sort of thing. So it's, it's almost like easier to bring somebody along right now. It's a segue to kind of help educate people. Those are touch points we haven't really had in Bitcoin's history. They're not, or at least they're not as overt until they have been the last couple of years. It's so true. It's right, it's right in your face. And it, it does make the job, it does make our jobs that much easier lately, right? Which is they're asking questions and it's so difficult to pontificate and preach Bitcoin. And it is so much more effective to, yeah, you respond to questions, you know, uh, use the Socratic method, basically, you know, get people to get their wheels turning in their head and just basically respond with material and, and content, right? Um, it, it's amazing. Uh, it's amazing to think about the fact that, yeah. Oh wait, the dollars, where do they come from? They just come out of thin air. But what does it mean that that the dollars are just on a ledger or some system of ledgers? Oh, what does that mean for money? Oh, money actually is fundamentally a ledger. And what kind of ledger do I want keeping track of my money? Do I want a ledger that can be uh altered, you know, with a few keystrokes, or do I want to hold my money on a ledger? that dedicates more energy than any other ledger to the maintain to the maintenance and uh, veracity uh, of that ledger itself and um yeah that's that's a that's a question that i put to my uncle recently was uh something along the lines of you know can you imagine storing your wealth in any system other than the system that dedicates the most energy to maintaining it to maintaining its security. And uh, yeah, that's really the fundamental question uh, that I ask myself on a daily basis. And on a daily basis, uh, the only answer I can uh, I come across is Bitcoin. As we round towards home, 
I think we need to highlight. We've spent some time talking about risks of Bitcoin. Uh, your book is one of the best resources I can think of in terms of covering a myriad of of topics on that front. Like you hit technical risks, political risks, economic risks, uh, sociological and, and psychological risks. You just do a really good job outlining some real world concerns and potential issues of Bitcoin. Nothing's perfect. Bitcoin's included. So if you are a listener that's like, hey, I want to I want to dig into that more and uh, steel man my position. Why buy Bitcoin is a great resource to to engage with that line of thinking. Well, I really appreciate that, Dan. I really appreciate that, Josh. And uh, yeah, that's why that's why I wrote it was uh, the fort, as I call it, the 40 pages of FUD. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of the reasons, right, is, OK, you got to line up all these pins and then you got to knock them down. And you got to do it, uh, you know, in a logical manner. And that it doesn't mean that there's no risks to Bitcoin, but in the final analysis, yeah, the conclusion I reach is that given the risks and given how, uh, you know, how overblown people think they are, and given the reality that the the actual probability of something severely impairing or killing Bitcoin is so minuscule. Given that that's what the analysis indicates, you know, it's really hard to get excited about any other asset, any other investment on a risk adjusted basis uh, over Bitcoin. Yes. And uh, I felt that way, you know, years ago when I found it, and I still feel that way today. And obviously, Bitcoin is more than an asset. Uh, it's, it's uh, as they say, money you can't fuck with. Uh, so if you learn, to secure your keys properly and cold store them properly and custody them yourself. Um, it's a whole other level of freedom and self-reliance and confidence uh, that you'll have in your life. In addition to the high likelihood, in my opinion, that uh, the value goes up over time um, and that wealth is accumulated as this asset basically I don't want to say takes over the financial system, but uh, let's just say takes a bigger and bigger bite out of all these different asset classes in the world. You know, gold is just the most low hanging fruit, the most obvious. Uh, it's gonna it's gonna eat trillions, probably tens of trillions, and maybe ultimately in excess of a hundred trillion of value. I think over the next decade or two, and uh, it's still early. It is still so. So early, gentlemen. Um, it's not too late to learn about Bitcoin. Uh, it's not too late to get exposure. You should do both at the same time. Get your feet wet. Start learning. Continue learning. Keep digging. You know, Don't take my word for it. Don't take these guys' word for it. Um, do your own research. And uh, if you reach different conclusions, you know, let us know. Uh, tweet at us. Um, you know, give us, uh, give us your thoughts. I'm always interested to to test the thesis and see where I'm wrong. And uh, so far it's held up well, but uh, I welcome that criticism also. Get yourself a piece of this motherfucking network, folks. Yeah. Hey man, there's a limited supply of it. We don't want to hear from me XRP maxis though. <laughs> what was that? I was saying, I don't want to hear from any XRP maxis. It seems to be less, fewer and fewer of those clowns. The XRP army, they used, yeah, they used to, you know, I used to get attacked by them. That's probably because I used to attack XRP uh, more on Twitter. Like I, I used to be a, a little more toxic. And then I don't know if they just died off, you know, or like I got less aggressive or what. But yeah, maybe it's a combination. <laughs> I don't see him as much anymore either. Both. It's good. I don't see him. It, it may just been uh, years of pain finally beat out of him. Um, but, uh, but who knows? We may have just invoked the wrath of the XRP army. I Come hope at so. us. Come at us. Bring it. Bring the pain. <laughs> <laughs> Andy, give us a handoff to you and your material. Yeah. So obviously, Why Buy Bitcoin is the book. You can get it on Amazon, Apple, et cetera. Um, Twitter handle is Edstrom Andrew. Um, you know, Swan Bitcoin. Uh, check us out. Swanbitcoin.com. Uh, if you have a financial advisor or you, you are a financial advisor, check out swanbitcoin.com forward flight forward slash advisor because we're launching a um you know a product basically to help clients invest in bitcoin and uh yeah you can check out andyedstrom.com if you want to see like other 
podcast conversations and uh, stuff I've written. Thanks for giving us your time. Enjoyed it. And thank you for the book. Pleasure, guys. This is great. Keep doing, uh, keep doing the great work. And uh, it was a fun conversation. Thanks for having me on. Thank you. Thanks so much for listening into the show. If you enjoyed this discussion, be sure to like or subscribe on whatever app you're using for podcasts or on YouTube. And if you have an extra minute, go ahead and leave us a review. We are also active on Twitter at blue underscore collar BTC. And our email address is blue collar Bitcoin podcast at gmail.com. We invite questions, comments, or inquiries of any kind. We look forward to you joining us again on the BCB podcast. Yeah, 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 yeah.